Many lesser tribes, including the Ponca, Omaha, Osage, Kanza, and Quaka tribes, comprise the sizable Suwon tribal linguistic group. Once residing east of the Mississippi River, these five tribes had started to migrate westward just before Columbus arrived. About 1500, the Ponca and Omaha tribes broke apart from the other tribes. The Omaha and Ponca, so the story goes, followed the Des Moines River to its sources and then headed northeast. Eventually, they crossed the Missouri River and drove out the Arikara tribe, who inhabited the west bank of the river in a region that would subsequently become part of Nebraska. Ponca and Omaha split off some time after the Arikara encounter. One has dated the split to as early as 1390 and as late as 1750. The Ponca were undoubtedly residing in the area where the Neobrara empties into the Missouri by 1789. The Ponca tribe was never a big one. Probably never more than 800 existed between 1800 and 1900. They show on Pius map of 1701 and were discovered once again in 1789 by merchant Juan Baptiste Mounier. There were people living close to the Neobrara River mouth by then. A smallpox pandemic struck them hard about that period. By Lewis and Clark's reckoning, there were only 200 of them in 1804. They were back up to 733 by 1874, all of them residing close to the Neobrara. The Ponca tribe called Standing Bear Machu Naza. Though some accounts state he was born in 1829, he was born on the Ponca Reserve around 1834. Early on in life, he became a chief because of his extraordinary talents. Between 1817 and 1865, the Ponca tribe and the federal government signed a number of treaties. They were compelled, like many other Nebraskan tribes, to watch as their ancestral grounds shrank until the majority were relocated to the Indian Territory in the modern state of Oklahoma. The Ponca gave up a significant portion of territory to the United States in 1858. Government, although they did allot the tribe a much lesser territory to live in, one year after the pact was ratified, they committed to moving to the restricted region. They were going to live there permanently. Before completing the treaty-making process to cement relationships between the United States and the Indians, the government signed four treaties with the Ponca. In 1817, 1825, 1858, and 1865 treaties were negotiated with the Ponca. With relation to the 1879 Standing Bear versus Crook court case, the third and fourth treaties are the most important. The goal, as the Commissioner for Indian Affairs said in his 1858 report, was to colonize and domesticate the Ponca. Ponca people intended to abandon hunting in favor of an agricultural economy, but they also had to contend with drought, locust, confrontations with the Sioux, and the government not keeping its word. Still, the Ponca never betrayed or harmed the white man. They honored their word. In 1865, another pact was signed, this one committing the Ponca to moving their reserve south and east of its previous site. The tribe traded most of their 1858 reservation for territory south of Ponca Creek and the Neobarara River. They also received Neobarara Islands in front of the new reserve territory. The 96,000 acres of reserve that this treaty established were located in the modern Nebraskan counties of Knox and Boyd. The Ponca were returning to their ancestral agricultural fields and their historic burial places, according to the pact. Shifting the Ponca away from the Sioux, who were on the assault from the West, was a third motive. Regretfully for the Ponca, in 1868, the U.S., the government, and the several Sioux Nation tribes signed a pact. Known by many as the Fort Laramie Treaty, it established a sizable Sioux Reserve that included much of South Dakota west of the Missouri River. Sadly, some of the territory set aside for the Ponca in the 1865 treaty were also included in the southern boundaries of the South Dakota region. The Sioux therefore received the majority of the tribe's territory, or around 96,000 acres. How on earth could this occur? Most likely because the Ponca terms of the 1865 pact had escaped the notice of the commissioners of the Fort Laramie Pact, General Sherman, Harney, Terry, etc. Two distinct tribes were therefore given the same territory. For the Ponca tribe, it prepared the way for their Trail of Tears. Decades of violated treaties left the Ponca vulnerable to Sioux raids 
extreme weather, and inadequate American financial assistance. Authority. About 1875, A.J. Carrier, the Ponca agent, went to Washington to see President Grant about relocating the Ponca to the Indian Territory. Grant consented to the transfer if the Ponca were open to it. Declaring that the Ponca would be better off migrating, Carrier went back to the Ponca Reserve to meet with the tribal members. These talks led Standing Bear and other tribe members to sign a document committing them to relocate to the Indian Territory. On September 11 and 23, 1875, Ponca Indian agent A.J. Carrier met with Ponca. Following the final meeting, Standing Bear and a few Ponca tribe members signed a letter committing them to relocate to Indian Territory. Additionally, they requested permission for a delegation of Ponca chiefs to tour the Indian Territory with the aim of selecting a new reserve. Carrier subsequently said that the agreement reflected the consensus of the Indians in attendance at the discussions. Later on, however, Standing Bear said that there was a miscommunication since the Ponca language did not have a specific term for territory in the Indian Territory. He said he had a good basis to believe he was consenting to relocate to the Omaha Reservation. Still, Washington sent Indian Inspector E.C. Kemble to meet with Ponca leaders in 1877, arrange for them to tour the Indian Territory and choose a location for a new reservation. A reconnaissance trip marked the start of the Trail of Tears. Inspector E.C. Kemble, along with Ponca Agent J, were involved. To choose a location for the future Ponca Reservation, Lawrence, Standing Bear, and nine other Ponca chiefs headed for the Osage Reservation in Indian Territory. When the Ponca arrived, several of the Osage leaders were absent due to the poorly planned visit. As a result, the Ponca could not engage in meaningful commerce, and the proposed property for their reserve was unsatisfactory. Standing Bear and the other tribe chiefs told Kemble they wanted to go back home. Their reluctance to scan any more territory infuriated Kemble. He declined to grant their desire to go back home, labeling their acts insubordination. Standing Bear chose to return on his own on February 21, 1877, along with seven of his fellow chiefs. Midwinter meant they had to spend a lot of time sleeping on the wide grassland and go days without food. According to an agent from the Oto Reservation in Gage County, the Ponca chiefs left bloody footprints on the snow. April 2nd, 1877, saw the Ponca chiefs arrive on the Ponca Reservation after a difficult voyage. Kemble was back, sadly, for Standing Bear and the Ponca, and he had fresh instructions from Washington to relocate the Ponca to Indian Territory, with force if needed. Ponca's readiness to depart was split. Those who were prepared to go south set off on April 16th with Kemble. Standing Bear and the rest of the Ponca tribe began their protracted trek to Indian Territory in May, prodded forward by the U.S. military. Almost from the start of the journey, the tribe had to deal with inclement weather and intense heat by the time they arrived at their objective. Nine individuals perished en route, including Prairie Flower, the daughter of Stan Bear, who passed away from consumption and was interred at Milford, Nebraska. White Buffalo Girl, the daughter of Moonhawk and Black Elk, also met her demise and lay in a grave near Nilai, Nebraska. The Nilai community placed an oak cross above the girl's gravestone as part of a Christian burial. In 1913, Nilai built a marble monument in honor of Black Elk's daughter's burial. Still there. On the Quapaw Reservation, the Ponca were not at all content with the land or living conditions. There were horrible sanitary conditions and most of the land was unfit for farming. Malaria claimed numerous lives when government officials hesitated to provide sufficient agricultural equipment. Nearly a third of the tribe has perished since they left Nebraska. In January 1879, Standing Bear's son, Bear Shield, perished. Distressed, the chief made the decision to bury his child again on his Nebraskan tribal grounds. Although it was another dreadful voyage, Standing Bear and his supporters reached the Omaha Reservation on March 4th 1879. Without national government authorization, Standing Bear and his supporters fled the Indian Territory. They were to be apprehended and brought back, from General Sherman in Washington, to General Sheridan in Chicago, to General Crook in Omaha. The arrest order gradually made its way down the lines. Following Crook's orders, Lieutenant Carpenter and four of his soldiers 
captured Standing Bear and his allies and took them to Fort Omaha, where they were to remain until their return to Indian Territory. March 27, 1879, saw Standing Bear and other tribal members taken into custody at Fort Omaha. Colonel John H. King, the post commander, said the Ponca were unwell and their horses were in poor health, making it difficult for the Indians to return to Indian Territory at this time. The Ponca benefited from the wait since Omaha Daily Herald associate editor Thomas Henry Tibbles learned about the Standing Bear issue. He was an enthusiastic crusader with empathy for the Indians. The way Tibbles learned about the case is a matter of significant debate. According to Tibbles, the city editor of the Omaha Daily Herald, his newspaper, told him about the case in 1880. However, Tibbles revealed that General Crook's involvement was the real reason he became involved in the Standing Bear case years after Crook's death. He related an exchange with Crook. Looking back at American West history, the general consensus is that the army was cruel and intended to wipe off Indians. A number of books, motion pictures, and television shows have popularized this viewpoint. Not every army commander in the West was a murderer, but there was violence. Many sympathized with the suffering of Indians and disapproved of government actions that appeared to aim at relocating all Indians to Indian territory. General Crook formally opposed parts of government Indian policy in a letter to President Grant as late as 1871. However, Crook never made his sentiments public, believing it would be improper for him to take a public stance. Following his assumption of leadership in the Department of the Platte, he concluded that the official reports were not particularly helpful. By 1879, however, he was criticizing government Indian practices even more forcefully. March 31, 1879, saw General Crook interview Standing Bear and a few of his tribesmen at Fort Omaha. Crook invited writer Thomas Tibbles to the conference. Standing Bear responded to General Crook's inquiry about his departure from the Indian Territory by saying, at last I had only one son left. Then he fell ill. When he was dying, he asked me to promise him one thing. When he was dead, he begged me to take him back to our old burial ground by the swift running waters, the Neobrara. I promised. When he died, I and those with me put his body in a box and then in a wagon, and we started north. Crook sympathized with the Ponca when Standing Bear had finished speaking, but he said he had a direct command and would have to follow it. It is a very disagreeable duty. The Ponca situation persuaded General Crook that he needed to communicate his opinions more forcefully. Crook's position forced him to confront government policies head on but it also drew him closer to the coalition of civilian reformers he had previously distrusted. According to a Thomas Tibbles report, Crook said he would resign his commission if he believed it would prevent the government from making the Ponca return to Indian territory. They also cited him as saying he would take his case directly to Washington, despite the administration typically issuing directives that contradicted his advice. Crook monitored the Ponca at Fort Omaha while Tibbles tirelessly worked to disseminate Standing Bear's story and convince others to support the Ponca cause. He penned an ardent editorial for the Omaha Herald on April 1, 1879, and telegraphed the tale of Crook's conversation with Standing Bear to Eastern publications. Tibbles gathered the support of the pastors of Omaha's top churches and pleaded via telegraph to Secretary of the Interior Carl Schurz to revoke his order of expulsion. Writings of Thomas Tibbles. Therefore, despite my double night duties for the Herald, I stole my afternoons from sleep to spend them in a law library. I had to devise a case and a method that could release these abused Pankas and then recast our nation's entire Indian policy. Tibbles then drafted a court case using the recently ratified 14th Amendment and presented it to A and his buddy John L. Webster, a young attorney in Omaha. Jay Poppleton served as the principal lawyer for Union Pacific Railroad. Without charge, both individuals promised to represent the Standing Bear and the Ponca. The two lawyers then filed a habeas corpus case with Judge Elmer S. Dundee of the U.S. District Court to force General Crook to explain why he had detained the Ponca. Known to be sympathetic to the underprivileged, Dundee issued the writ and demanded that the other side show up. April 30th, 1879, saw the start of the two-day trial in Omaha. The American delegate for the trial was Ha M. Lambertson. The American delegate M. Lambertson 
argued that an Indian could not file a lawsuit against the government because he was neither a person nor a citizen in the traditional legal sense. Lambertson further argued that the Ponca followed their customs, were reliant on the government, and were not entitled to the benefits and rights of citizens because they were Indians. The Indians' lawyers argued that the Ponca had relinquished their tribal power, engaged in farming, made significant progress in assimilation, and deserved equal treatment under the 14th Amendment. The attorneys also argued that the United States government lacks the authority to evict the Ponca people or relocate them to Indian territory. Judge Dundee gave Standing Bear the floor. Standing Bear spoke no English, but via Suzette, Bright Eyes, La Flesh, his translator, he was able to make a moving appeal to the court. 